the Mutual Broadcasting System, in cooperation with Family Theater Incorporated, presents Suspended Moment, starring Victor Jory and Barry Kroger. Victor Moore is your host. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. They say that every family has at least one skeleton in the closet. All right, who knows? Maybe my ancestors were pirates. And maybe your old Uncle Harry, who turns up every few years, never did a day's work in his life. Well, if you're going to start worrying about a family skeleton, it's good to remember the neighbors next door may have a bigger one. Only they keep it in a better closet, that's all. Yes, we all hold highly with respectability. And the idea of living up to the Joneses keeps a lot of people awake nights. That is, until they come to a realization that all the time the Joneses are usually trying to keep up with them. You know, a family can be happiest when they have their own high standards, their own family life within their home. And the best way for complete unity in a home is family prayer. Family prayer is the secret every home can have for a happy family life. Praying together as a family means God's daily blessing. And when you live up to the daily practice of family prayer, you have indeed the best example for a happy home that any family can give. Victor Moore will return after tonight's family theater play, starring Victor Jory and Barry Kroger in Suspended Moment. The other day, the newspapers carried a story about John Dillard Durant. He was one of the two men mentioned to head a newly created and important government agency. Overnight, the success story of lawyer Durant was being read throughout the nation. A few of the facts were, he started his law practice in the industrial city of Central Falls. His clients were mostly the local steel workers. In the following years, his fame had grown, and after the sensational Tricondo Steel case, he had become nationally known. But Durant had stayed in Central Falls, despite his nationwide success. Here, then, is the untold story of a successful man. The story of why he never lost touch with his humble beginnings. The story of one suspended moment. It opens in the law offices of John Dillard Durant. Yes, Miss Walsh, what is it? Mr. Durant, there's a gentleman here who insists on seeing you. Insists? Who is he? What does he want? His name is Seldwich, Stephen Seldwich. He says he has to see you personally. Can't see him. Mr. Durant can't see you, Mr. Seldwich. Uh, now, wait a minute, Mr. Seldwich. You can't go in there. What's going on here? Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Durant. I couldn't stop it. Please, Mr. Durant, I have to talk to you. Please, please. My son, you must help me. I can't do anything for you. Mr. Durant, you remember me? Stephen Selvich, you won a case for me. Uh, I did? You got me $1,200 from the Central Fall Railroad. That was eight years ago. Man alive, you don't expect me to drop everything because I won a case for you eight years ago. But you promised me. You tell all of us if ever we need help, we can count on you. Always. Well, uh... Circumstances have altered the situation. Mr. Durant, look. My son is in jail. The police say he killed somebody. My boy killed nobody. He is innocent. Uh, Seldwich? Oh, yes, at, at Willow Creek. That's your boy? Yeah, Frank Seldwich. You know about him? 
Everybody say you are the only one who can help, my Frank. I'm sorry, Selvich, but I'm leaving for Washington in 20 minutes. But, Mr. Durant, you promised to take the case, and now you say no. Now, look, Selvich, I wouldn't handle that case now, even if I were free to do so. But my boy's life, don't you understand? You can save him. If you say you take the case, we we get a postponement or, or something. There are a dozen other lawyers in town. Please, that... Mr. Durant. Everybody say to me, Selvich... Mr. Durant is the lawyer for your boy. He's a smart man. He's no afraid of judge. They give him fair trial. Seldwich, I'm due in Washington to handle a $25 million trust suit. Petty criminal cases are a bit out of my line these days. I'm sorry. But a life, a life is in your hands. Yes, Miss Walsh? Your car is waiting, Mr. Durant. Thank you, Miss Walsh. Are all the Magna Corporation papers in my briefcase? Yes, Mr. Durant. Be right out. I'm late now, Seldwich. Excuse but me. But Mr. Durant! A life! A life is in your hands! Sorry! El Capitan now loading on track three. Congressional Limited for Washington now leaving on track one. Oh! Oh! Newspapers, magazines, cigarettes, cigars. Newspapers, magazines, cigarettes. Tickets, please. Oh, Mr. Durant. How do you do, sir? Is everything all right? Fine, conductor, fine. I suppose it's Washington, D.C. again. <laughs> yes, again, but not the White House yet. It's the federal courts again. Yeah, read about it this morning. The Magna Trust case. Mm, that's the one. Well, as the caboose said to the locomotive when they unhitched it, I'm off. <laughs> Good night. Just ring if you need anything, Mr. Durant. Thank you, conductor. Yes, Mr. Durant. What happened? What is what? It sounded like a wreck. No wreck, Mr. Durant. The switch was not thrown properly. Everything's all right now. Oh, uh, say, where, where, where's the other conductor, Worcester? What's happened to him? Uh, I'm his relief. Relief? I, I didn't know we'd come to a station stop. Oh, yes. We just uh, switched locomotives. Oh. Well, I, I must have dozed. I was certain we were in a wreck. You sure we're moving? Quite sure, sir. What? What's that? Oh. Well, let me know when we get to Washington. Yes, Mr. Durant. There's something very... Uh... 
Oh, well, I... I guess I'm just... Overtired. Hmm. Well, should be in Washington in half an hour. Here we are, Mr. Durant. Uh, mm? oh, oh, oh. Oh, we're here, huh? Uh, good. So will you um you have the porter take these bags? I'd be glad to help, sir. This way, please. Yeah. Here you are, sir. Thank you. Here's a dollar for your trouble. No, uh, thank you. Huh? Well. <laughs> Well, you're the first one in all my years of traveling who's turned down a tip. How long have you been with this company? Oh, a long time, sir. Watch your step, sir. Hmm. Certainly good to get off that train. Cap, right here. Oh, yes. Here we are, sir. Say, these cabs are new, aren't they? No, sir. They've always been this way. Oh. Uh, uh, where are you going? Didn't you say the Hall of Justice? Well, I don't remember saying that. But that's where I'm going. Yes, sir. Now, why didn't you go down Connecticut Avenue to the Hall of Justice? That's the shortest way. This is the way I always go, sir. Oh. <laughs> hey, you cabbies will do anything to run up that meter. Yeah, by the way, how's the weather been? Same as usual. Very nice. As usual? It was below zero the last time I was here. Here we are, sir. Well, what's the fare? No charge, sir. What? what? Say... What is this, a joke? No, sir. There's no charge. Well, I... Oh, 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 I get it now. J.D. McDonald of Magna Corporation sent you to pick me up, huh? <laughs> oh, J.D. is always up to some stunt like this. I'll bet he took care of you plenty. Okay. Thanks for the ride. Now, let me see. Have I forgotten anything? Hmm? No, no. Mm -hmm. I guess everything's here. Well, I don't see the Magna Carta case posted. Guess I better check at the information desk. Uh, say, uh, pardon me, in, in what courtroom is the Magna Corporation case? I'm John Dillard Durant. John Dillard Durant? Hmm? Oh, yes. Uh, your case is in courtroom three. That's the third room down this corridor. My case, did you say? <laughs> well, it looks like I've really arrived. Uh, Bailiff, I'm John Dillard Durant. Oh, yes, Mr. Durant. And uh, what case on the docket is the Magna Corporation? Your case, Mr. Durant, is the only one. The only one, did you say? Yes. Well, I, I don't think my client, J.D. MacDonald, uh, has come yet. Your client? Oh, yes. Look, you didn't by any chance happen to notice him, did you? He's a, he's a large man, about six feet tall, white-haired. He was to meet me here. Well, it won't matter as long as you're here, Mr. Durant. Oh, now, Bailiff, you know very well the law demands the accused to be present. The judge is coming on the stand. You'd better take your seat, Mr. Durant. Oh. Order. Order in the courtroom. Please rise. 
Thank you, friends. Be seated. <coughs> this court located in the halls of justice is now convened. Bailiff, read the case. The people versus John Dillard Durant. Your Honor, uh, Your Honor, I'd, I'd like to correct that citation. And how should it read, Mr. Durant? Well, I'm just the counsel for the Magna Corporation. The case in hand is, uh, is the United States government versus the Magna Corporation. I'm sure you're mistaken, Mr. Durant. It is out of the jurisdiction of this court to handle civil cases, either by the government or by private parties. Out of the jurisdiction? Uh, oh, well, I, I must be in the wrong courtroom. No, Mr. Durant. You're in the proper court for your case. You're just confused as to what is the case at bar. But, Your Honor, I didn't come here to defend myself. I tell you, I'm here as attorney for the Magna Corporation. There aren't any charges against me. Suppose I read them to you. The people of Central Falls versus Mr. John Dillard Durant. The people of my hometown? <laughs> oh, that's ridiculous. Mr. Durant, I trust I need not remind you of the proper procedure in a court of law. Now, the specific accusation is a test case against you. Your moral negligence in the life and death of one Frank Seldwich, age 22, home, Central Falls. Now, Your Honor, if this is some sort of a joke, I fail to see the humor of it. I wouldn't know Frank Seldwich if I saw him. The only knowledge I have of him was through his father, who asked me to handle a case which I refused. And that is my unalienable right. Frank Seldwich also has unalienable rights. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. For well, you see, Mr. Durant, the crime you are charged with in this court is based on the omission of your duty. And that duty is contingent upon promises you have made. No court of law in the land would concede that charge. Mr. Durant, listen well to what I say to you in this moment. This is not a court of law. This is the final court from which there is no appeal. And your life, like Frank Selwich's, is being held in the balance. <laughs> And now will the prosecution present the case of the people versus John Dillard Durant? Your Honor, since this is the defendant's first experience in this court, I suggest that he be informed of his privilege in the selection of jurors. Mr. Durant, you have the privilege of selecting 12 persons from our jury panel. No. Your Honor, may I see the list? There are no lists, Mr. Durant. You may select them from these people gathered in this courtroom. Did you say... Uh, uh people in, in this courtroom? Yes. You will notice that all of them are citizens of Central Falls. I'm sure you know many of them personally. But, Your Honor, surely you don't expect me to get a fair trial from, from, from these people? Well, I've, uh, well, I've had legal skirmishes and differences with, with quite a number of them sitting in this court. Mr. Durant, sometimes it is necessary to justify the ways of God to man. But in this court... It is imperative that you justify your ways to God. Your Honor, I would like to ask a few questions of the defendant. Will the bailiff call the defendant to the stand? John Dillard Durant, please take the stand. Do you, John Gilliard Durant, swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. You may be seated. Now, Mr. Durant, how long have you been practicing law? Fourteen years. How many cases would you say you've handled during those years? <laughs> well, I couldn't say. Oh, nearly a thousand, I presume. Your records show you've handled some 850 cases. In the first year, you had 17 cases. And out of that number, you were paid for only three, is that correct? Well, I, uh, I don't know, I guess so. I just started my law practice in the industrial section of Central Falls, and most of the people well, didn't have the price of food. But since those heroic few years, you've been very well paid, haven't you, Mr. Durant? I have. 
In fact, today you're reputed to be worth nearly half a million dollars, is that right? Oh, now, Your Honor, I object to this line of cross-examination as being irrelevant, immaterial, and beside the point. Mr. Prosecutor, I presume that you have a reason for this line of questioning. I have, Your Honor. I wish to use the example in my summation to the jury. Proceed. Mr. Durant, do you recall a day... It was the afternoon of your graduation from law school. You'd walked apart from the crowd. You stood alone under the old elm tree on the east end of the campus. You remember that day? No. Yeah. What did you tell yourself? I, uh... I don't think that has anything to do with this case. What was your promise? Well, I've been very fortunate. The opportunities I had had, the help others had given me to realize my ambitions. I guess I... I guess I appreciated the advantages that were mine. Yes. And what did you say? Well, I don't think I expressly said anything. Then what was the intention formulated in your mind? Now, now, I object to this line of questioning. Objection overruled. Answer the question, Mr. Durant. What was your promise to yourself? I guess I intended to show my appreciation for what I had received by... by helping others whenever I had the opportunity to do so. And did you, on any subsequent occasions, publicly express this intention? Possibly. Possibly? Do you recall the first case you won? A case for the defendant, Stanislaus Maleski? Yes. You walked out of the courtroom, and a group of men gathered around you on the steps of the courthouse. Then Mrs. Maleski came up to you through the crowd, with her baby in her arms. What did she say to you? Well, she, she told me they were unable to pay my fee. And what did you say? Well, I guess it had been difficult getting started in my practice, and I told her I was sufficiently paid by just having won the case. And then the group standing there applauded you. <laughs> yes. And what did you say to them? I told them I was their friend. Go on. That I would be ready and willing to help them always. On any occasion on which they asked your help? Yes. Why did you tell them that? Because I appreciated having them as my friends. It, uh... It meant getting a start in my law practice. Were you sincere in what you said to them? Yes. At, at the time, I meant it sincerely. But you changed your opinion later. Well, better opportunities came my way. And you forgot those who had helped you when you most needed their help. I was very, very busy. You were too busy to become the man you had promised and pledged yourself to be? Well, now, wait. I have to make a living for myself, for my family. And the help you would return to others would have prevented you from making a living? Well, it might have slowed me down, and I, well, I wouldn't have gotten much out of it. And you had decided that the most important thing was what you would get out of anything. Your material possession. Well, now, wait a minute. I wouldn't put it that way. Your Honor, that is what it meant. It amounted to that. Well, you're, 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 you're trying to put words into my mouth. No, Mr. Durant. These are facts. Step down, please. As prosecutor in this court, the task before me was simply this to show that the defendant, John Dillard Durant, had failed to extend his God-given talents to aid and succor the poor and the oppressed. That is all, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. Durant, there will be a short recess before the prosecution and the defense present their pleas to the jury. I would advise that you prepare well your final argument to the jury, since your time will be limited to 60 seconds. One suspended moment. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I wish to advise you of the grave responsibility of your decisions. You sit in judgment on John Dillard Durant for his crimes of omission. And so he must be judged. The jury will retire to consider the verdict in the case of John Dillard Durant. The decision must be rendered before the end of this suspended moment. There's someone in this compartment. Yeah, yeah, that's Mr. Durant's compartment. Go easy, easy there, easy. Yeah. Yeah, looks like he's knocked out cold. Man, it's a wonder he wasn't killed. Mr. Durant, 
Mr. Durant, are you all right? The jury will retire and consider the verdict. Uh, Mr. Durant, are you all right? Uh, uh-oh. What, what happened? Uh, we had a train accident. Oh. The last two cars were derailed. How long have I been here? Oh, not more than a minute. We got to you first. Well, that, that was the longest minute of my life. Now, if you feel all right, the first eight cars are going on to Washington. Uh, Washington? Well, yes. You're due there for that big trust case, the Magna Corporation. Oh, yes. Washington, the Magna... No. No, I've got a bigger one back in my hometown. The Seldwich case. This is Victor Moore again. I guess we all have moments in life, suspended moments, when we look back at good deeds that might have been done and were neglected. Yes, and the remembrance of these moments can give us a new faith in the future, a new faith in ourselves and our fellow men. You know what happens if families break up, and that's the lack of faith. Sometimes no one can feel happy about because the most wonderful thing in the world is to see two people get married. You always like to hope they will live happily ever afterward. And they should. Yes, marriage should be the most rewarding experience in life. It can be, with God's help. The family prayer should play an important part in daily family life. Because praying together as a family gives a spiritual bond of lasting security to marriage. That's why family prayer means family unity. For the family that prays together stays together. This is Victor Moore saying good night and God bless you. Our thanks to Victor Jory and Barry Kroger for their performances this evening, and to John Slott and Emil Frank for writing tonight's play. Music was scored and conducted by Max Tear. This production of Family Theatre Incorporated was directed by David Young. Others who appeared in tonight's play were Joe Graham, Jane Avello, Ralph Moody, Herbert Rawlinson, Norman Field, and Victor Perrin. Next week, our Family Theatre stars will be Joe E. Brown and Richard Tyler, in First Class Requirements. Your host will be Alan Mowbray. This series of the Family Theatre broadcasts is made possible by the thousands of you who felt the need for this kind of program, by the mutual broadcasting system which has responded to this need. Be with us next week at this same time when our family theater stars will be Joe E. Brown and Richard Tyler with Alan Mowbray as host. Dick Wynn speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.